I'm John Banther, and this is Classical Breakdown. From WETA Classical in Washington, we are your guide to classical music. In this episode, I'm joined by WETA Classical's Evan Keeley, and we're talking about one of the most influential people in music of the 20th century, Nadia Boulanger. She was a composer, a conductor, and a teacher, and her influence is still felt by musicians around the world today. We explore her life, her music, her students, and how she dealt with tragic events like death and war. Nadia Boulanger is a name that pretty much every musician knows, but maybe few listeners might actually recognize. She was one of the most influential musicians and teachers of the entire 20th century, And if you said she was the most influential, I think few people would really argue with you. If you really had to pick one person who's the most influential music teacher and musician of the 20th century, she's a great candidate for that award. Yes, she's had a direct impact on pretty much everyone graduating from music school. One of my first teachers at New England Conservatory was one of her students, and that is a very common story. I can tell the same story about my experience at the Boston University School of Music. But... Some people might be really worried right now and saying, hold on a second, why am I hearing uh, Quincy Jones, uh, Bye Bye Birdie, and the theme to Sesame Street, huh? That is, this doesn't sound right. But that's because all of those composers studied with her as well. And well, Warren, she had her musical hands in pretty much everything. All roads lead to Rome, or in this case, to Nadia Boulanger's apartment. I love that. And I think that's going to become crystal clear as we go on. And also looking back, we'll see that she was a complicated person. So stay with us as we get into that as well. Okay, so Juliette Nadia Boulanger was born on September 16, 1887 in Paris. And that's basically where she would spend her entire life. Her father, Ernest Boulanger, was a composer. He wrote uh, comic operas, I believe. And he was also a voice teacher at the Paris Conservatory. And he married Raisa Mishitskaya in 1877 after they met in Russia. And he was much older, about 40 or so years older than Raisa. And we'll have to leave that there because this is also the point, Evan, when we usually say the young child here, Nadia, was obsessed with music. You couldn't drag her away from the piano or the violin or she wouldn't stop singing. But that's not what was happening here. Not what happened at first. Uh, in fact, there's a story when she was very little, she hated music and she'd run away from, the, run out of the room if somebody was playing an instrument or something. And then there's this story when she was about five years old, she heard a, a fire siren or some such thing and she ran over to the piano and started banging on the keys to reproduce the sound. And then something clicked maybe in her mind and she suddenly became fascinated by music and the rest is literally history. Yes, something clicked, and she begins to study with her father, and that's very common when you see figures like this, Nadia Boulanger. They have someone very early on who is an expert and also guiding them, and she was just a a voracious practicer and consumer of music. Now, by the age of 10, she committed all of Bach's well-tempered clavier to memory. Now, that's something that a lot of pianists do, just natural, you play it so much. But, you know, she's 10 years old, and she's already got that memorized and and buttoned up. She's pretty serious from the start. And another milestone is when she's six years old in 1893, her sister is born, Lily Boulanger. And you'll hear us mention her more as we go on, because it's hard to talk about one without the other in this biographical context. So Nadia enters the Paris Conservatory in 1896. She is nine years old, and she has some great instructors like Gabrielle Faure right from the beginning, but also, Evan, just nine years old, and you're already having to go to school. There's no middle school, high school. Right, right. She's, she's, I mean, this is yet another story of a child prodigy, and her genius just continues to flourish throughout her life. But even from a very young age, she's already achieving at high levels. At the conservatory, she's winning first prize, which is uh, maybe has a little bit of a connotation that's hard to understand. It's really more like getting an A plus, Mm -hmm. or it means that you're among the top students in the class. And she got the first prize in solfege, in harmony. And these are in her very first year. So even before she hits puberty, she's already achieving at the highest levels at the Paris Conservatory, one of the most prestigious music schools in Europe at that point. And with students around her that are much older than her. Much older, much, yeah, very accomplished. So she is achieving at high levels among the best of the best. And talking about growing up fast, here is a story we talk about all the time on the podcast. 
Her father dies in 1900 of old age. I think he was very old at that point. And this causes the family financial hardship. They go into financial chaos. So the young children have to start doing things to help support this. And she begins her career as an organist in 1901 at the age of 13, also being the oldest child. I imagine this also is a very grow up fast kind of situation. And at 13, she's not only very accomplished in harmony and solfege and music theory, but she's also a very skilled organist, and people are noticing her extraordinary ability uh, with that instrument. So 13 years old, 1901, she's uh, already giving concerts and getting attention. I've played and continue to play with organists regularly, and I've never played with one that is 13 years old with these <laughs> kinds of abilities. You know, she was very exceptional. That'd be a, That'd be a lot of fun. And this is also around the time we find basically one of her earliest compositions. And it's a song. She wrote many. It's called Extas. And it is, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's, it's a nice song. It's beautiful. But more so, I love how she's kind of guiding us through all of these different kind of chords and progressions as we're walking along almost like in a, a forest with beautiful flora and fauna around you. And, you know, we mentioned earlier she uh, studied with Gabriel Faure, Louis Vierne was another one of her teachers at the conservatory. So you definitely hear the influences of those kinds of composers and that kind of French music of this era. But she, even, even as a child, has a distinctive voice. A couple of years later, in 1904, remember, she's still a teenager. She's like 16 or 17. And she begins to start teaching uh, quite seriously. And she was also determined at this time to win the prestigious Prix de Rome, which is an actual prize. And this is something her father won. Unfortunately, she never got past second place, but she was very determined and she had a lot of entries. And she also made a splash sometime um, in 1908. I think that's when she got second place and she did it with her cantata La Sirene. Beautiful piece. And I'll put a link on the show notes page as well. There was a recent performance a year or two ago of that. Yeah, so Prix de Rome, a very prestigious composition prize. Uh, you and I had a conversation last season, John, on the podcast. Uh, Claude Debussy was a winner uh, mm -hmm. years before. And as you mentioned, uh, the, uh, the, their father, Lily and Nadia's father, had won the prize many, many years earlier. And she also went against the rules that year. One of the requirements was to write a four-part vocal fugue, and she wrote it for string quartet instead. So already kind of, you know, pushing back on things. Pushing back on the rules a bit, yes. And it was her sister, Lily, who would become the first woman to win the prize in 1913 when uh, Lily was 19 years old. Yes, very gifted composer. Things continue. She is uh, a teenager. She's actually now getting um, into her early 20s, and she gets an assistant. And I would love to have had an assistant when I was in my early I'll 20s. Tell <laughs> yes, and tell us about her, Evan. Annette Diodonne uh, became her assistant in 1910, and that's a relationship that would continue throughout their lives. And uh, as you said, John, it'd be great to have an assistant when you're 20, but when you're Nadia Boulanger and you're already achieving uh, extraordinary levels by the time you reach your 20th birthday, well, I think you're entitled to have an assistant. And this, uh, this is a professional and personal relationship that lasts a lifetime. And it's also around this time she becomes familiar with Igor Stravinsky. I think she was at the premiere of his ballet, The Firebird. And this starts a whole relationship um, with Stravinsky and just thinking and believing, well, he is really a voice of the future, the kinds of, of writing and the lines that he is producing that seem to stretch on forever. She seemed to be enthralled by that. Yeah, the Firebird, uh, 1910. This is before the Rite of Spring, of course, a few years before, but uh, Stravinsky is already doing some pretty exciting things. And Nadia Boulanger has the genius and the talent to recognize uh, that this is a very important compositional voice. And as you said, John, they, they become friends, and uh, that's another lifelong relationship. As we've said, she is a skilled organist, and she was writing for it as well. And I don't listen to the organ a lot, just to be uh, to be honest. There's some early music and early Baroque stuff that I, I'll enjoy when I listen to it. But one thing I do like are 
works for organ by French composers around this time. Right. I like her and uh, Maurice Durafouet as well. Just really, really nice. So it's nice that we do have from 1911 a set of three pieces that she wrote for organ that are um, just wonderful. Terribly exciting period in the history of organ music. There's a lot we could say about this and we don't really have time to get into it, but uh, you know, the organ building technology toward the end of the 19th century really makes a leap forward. Mm -hmm. And you see, especially in France, these huge instruments that make sounds that the world has never heard before. You have electric pumps to, to push the air through. That's a new in innovation as well. And uh, uh, Nadia Boulanger is playing the organ with all of these famous French orchestras. She's playing these famous new organs. There's the uh, Trocadero Palace, had this humongous organ. It, this is auditorium that seated thousands of people. And she played there in, as a teenager and as a young adult. And uh, you have a lot of these organist composers in France, especially at this time, who are writing really exciting music for these new instruments that have, you know, have these capabilities that are new. Very exciting period in music history. And if you ever get a chance to hear an organ recital in a place like that, I highly recommend it. Again, I said I've, I've played with organists semi-frequently, and just the other day I was playing with one. I'm on stage. It's 110 decibels yeah. where it really is not safe for your hearing for yeah. any extended period of time, yeah. but you are in the sound. And that is what Nadia Boulanger is, is doing at the forefront of this new organ technology. And imagine in an age before amplification, before microphones and speakers, to be surrounded by that kind of sound. Of course, there were organs in the 18th century and so yeah. forth. They didn't have the kind of power no. that you see in these humongous French organs of this era that Nadia Boulanger is playing. Mm. And what a, what a thrill, what an what a astonishing experience for an audience to be exposed to those kinds of sounds. That is a great point. And... In the following year, in 1912, she makes her conducting debut with that cantata she wrote, La Sirene, and she had a couple of other works in that performance as well. But just a couple of years later, in Europe, of course, we have the tragedy and outbreak of World War I in 1914. So naturally from this point, for several years, musical work is diminished. Um, things are, I mean, I think this is something we now have some context with after the last four years of what happens. Social disruption and how it affects the arts definitely a, a factor in this, in this phase of her life and the whole world's life. And tragically for Lily, she won that prize, the Prix de Rome, the year before. And when you win this award, you get sent off to Italy for at least a year, I think. You're composing, you're studying, and you're premiering all these new works. But a few months into it, what? The she's, war breaks out and yeah. you're not going to Italy, Lily. Sorry. Yeah. She's there for a little bit. She's got to go right back. And that's when her and her sister, Nadia, who we're, of course, focusing on, they started a charity that was supplying food, clothes, money, kind of care packages, I guess, to soldiers who were also musicians. Of course, we know so many composers that we love today were in World War One. Indeed. And it really gives us a sense of Nadia's character, too. I mean, here's somebody, you know, the, this terrible war breaks out, it engulfs literally the entire world. Certainly Europe is absolutely consumed in this horrible, horrible war. Mm -hmm. And she and her sister start this organization, which actually is quite effective in providing aid to musicians. So here again, she is just, you know, taking command of her life. She's stepping forward and doing things that nobody else is doing or that not enough people are doing with this immense confidence in herself. And uh, it's just really extraordinary, her, her ability to just seize life uh, in, in this bold way. And you see it again and again throughout her life. It's one of those things that you can only kind of see in, and recognize in this kind of context 100 years later, just these big moments and, this, and the decisions she makes at each um, junction. And this brings us to 1918, which is a tragic year because her sister, Lily, would die at the age of 24. She suffered from poor health from childhood. And of course, this is naturally devastating for Nadia, as it would be for anyone who loses a close sibling um, like this in a young, tragic way. And she considered her to be a greater composer, from what I understand. I think that's uh, that's certainly true, and I have to agree. I think Nadia Boulanger is a very talented composer, but Lily, mm -hmm. you know, in her very short life, wrote some really remarkable music. It's also interesting to notice the ways in which Nadia, as a performer, is promoting her sister's music very intentionally, mm -hmm. with great pride in her sister's talent. 
And she stops, Nadia, that is, composing after this point, basically. She writes a couple more things up to 1922, but that's when it kind of just stops. And she said something which I kind of don't like hearing it, but she said, if there is one thing of which I am certain is that I wrote useless music. It's a shame she felt that way. It wasn't a huge output that she already had. It was a relatively small output. Her chamber music and her songs are especially wonderful. She did write a fantasy for piano and orchestra. I'll put a link on the show notes page. That's also nice. So maybe she wasn't at that same level as her sister, and she believed that. But of course, she wasn't writing useless music. Certainly not. Uh, And we should certainly remember her as a very fine composer, even though that wasn't the primary focus of her long life. So that might be something interesting. Well, her long life, it's 1918. She's what, like, um, you know, in her in her 20s or 30s, and she stops composing. Well, what happens then? Well, we're going to get into that because she is, a, as we said, a massive um, influence. So after World War I, she finds herself in a different world from before, I think much as we experience today. And going forward, she is heavily focused on teaching. And she is focused to an extent that it's almost you know, not good for her health, the kind of schedule, uh, demanding schedule that she's taking on. In 1919, a new school was um, founded in Paris, and then a sister conservatory was um, founded a couple years later, and she went from the other one to this new one called the American Conservatory in 1921. And this was in Fontainebleau, or Fontainebleau, I think. Fontainebleau, Yes. And she's teaching harmony, um, solfege, and other classes. And this is when she meets someone I think we'll all recognize, right, Evan? 21-year-old Aaron Copeland was one of the first students at this new American conservatory. Virgil Thompson was another student of hers at that time. And he described her as a warm and intelligent woman. And she had kind of a gift for Americans. Looking back, I find that unusual in, in a good way, like that what you're talking about, uh, how she was, you know, stepping up for that charity. And for this, a lot of, I think a lot of people at that time might not want to be teaching people from the United States uh, just because the conservatory and levels are just, they're not there at this time. Yeah. But this conservatory, which was geared towards Americans, um, she was there and she accepted them and she really, really gave them her full effort. And it's interesting that Virgil Thompson makes this remark about her having a kind of a gift for Americans because it's really backed up by history. We can name many Americans, uh, Copeland and Thompson among them, uh, Leonard Bernstein, and there's a long list of Mm -hmm. Americans who studied composition with her, who studied piano or organ with her. uh, And she really, you know, she really did seem to have this way, this affinity of working with Americans for some reason. Mm -hmm. So she pours herself into this work, this demanding schedule, and she develops a reputation. And to further describe just kind of how she was, it seems like, and from the video I've seen of her, there's a documentary I'll put on the show notes page as well. She had this air of authority. She was kind of intimidating. She wore these dark suits with like a very angular cuts, and she was kind of more traditional and I don't want to say like Steve Jobs, but she kind of like had a uniform, it seems. Yeah, yeah. She definitely had a look. Yes. And she had these pince-nez glasses, if I'm saying that correctly. It's like not a monocle, but it's the old-timey glasses. Yeah, you hold them up with your... Yeah, so there's a kind of a severity to her appearance. You mm-hmm. see photographs and film of her. Uh, she did live a long life, and we have a lot of these images of her. And yeah, she comes across as this powerful, very serious person that you don't want to mess with. And uh, I, I, I get a sense that she really tried to cultivate that mm-hmm. in, in an intentional way. I don't know for sure. Uh, that's certainly how she came across. And there's lots of contemporary accounts of how she comes. She can be very warm. She get very personable, but she's also very serious, very demanding. And, uh, you know, we'll talk more about what it's like to study with her and the very different experiences people have and the controversy around that, but uh, definitely uh, not someone who suffers fools gladly, I think. Mm -hmm. And we can kind of dig into that a little bit now because, okay, she was a teacher. There's like a million great teachers. What, What about her is, you know, standing apart? She had a deep intuition and natural understanding of music. She could take a piece of music, 
and quickly make remarks as to what is happening, direction, good things, bad things, in an instant. And she had a deep, like crazy musical memory. I think a good example of this high level of um, performances is chess. If you take someone who doesn't know chess and you show them a picture of a chess board for literally less than three seconds, maybe two seconds, that is in the middle of the game, and then you say, okay, now walk over here to this real board and put all the pieces where they were, as you saw in that picture for one or two seconds, right? That's impossible for a typical person. But if you're a grandmaster chess player, that's Monday morning. That's very easy. In fact, they'll tell you, oh, that's from this board position. It's from this 1932 game yes. with, uh, yeah, exactly. And I think that's a great uh, analogy, John, that uh, Nadia Boulanger had that kind of deep insight and she was able to do things on that quick level that was just, you know, her brain would immediately process things on a very deep level. And it's one of the things that made her such an effective teacher. Yes. So there's this documentary made at the end of her life that also demonstrates this. Leonard Bernstein tells this story of how he was playing her a new song that he wrote. And there's this moment, uh, just a little moment, where there's this B-flat played in the bass. And she grabbed his arm. And you'll see that in the video. She would grab a student's arm to make them stop. Like You're really stopping your tracks. And she would start talking. And she grabs his arm and says, why did you put that B-flat there? Why, why would that go there? We just heard that in this voice a moment before. Remember, she's not looking at any music or anything. Actually, she doesn't really have much eyesight at that point. Yeah, at this point, her eyesight was so poor she couldn't see the score. But her ear would immediately pick these things up, these small details that she would instantly notice and be able to comment on in this, in this profound way. It's, 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 it's rather shocking to observe these kinds of moments. Yes. So... She says, well, that B-flat's in a different voice a moment before, and it's not too much higher, so that that sound is still in the ether, so to speak. This is something that you might realize looking at a score for a while, maybe an hour. You're going through a score, you're looking at stuff, hmm, you know, maybe this pedal B-flat right here, we could do something a little more interesting. But for her, it's just in that moment, she grabs you and says, what are you doing right here? Don't do that. Or you can do better. We also have an account from Charles Fisk, who wrote a lot about his studies with um, Nadia Boulanger. Why don't you read this for us, Evan? One foundational aspect of Boulanger's method was the memorization at the keyboard of specific four-part harmonic progressions and their subsequent transposition into all keys. These progressions exemplified two basic categories, cadences, progressions capable of articulating the conclusions of phrases, sections, or entire compositions, and sequences, transitional progressions, moving through musical space to link harmonic points of departure to ensuing points of arrival. To all of her students, Boulanger distributed a cadence sheet featuring specific progressions that arrived at tonic resolutions in a given key from every possible chordal point of origin in that key. By practicing these cadences, one internalized a specific way of employing an initiatory C major chord, not only as the home chord of C major, for example, but also as a functioning entity in A minor, G major, F major, E minor, and D minor. There is a lot there, probably confusing for a lot of people. But basically, she's having her students learn how to go from anywhere, from any point in a progression harmonically. Also, this can help you out um, melodically and how you lead things. She wants you to be able to do anything and everything at the drop of a hat. Right. And it's this question of memorizing these things on the keyboard. So I think she's even trying to induce a kind of muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Like it just becomes a part of your nervous system that you are able to hear and feel these things. And even in your hands and your arms, not only in your ears. Uh, it's It's a very physical experience of music that she's really trying to train people on a very, very deep level. And it seems to have had a really powerful effect on those who are able to master it. I think it definitely did. That last part is a great example. C major, a C major chord, a simple chord, that exists, of course, as the home chord of C major, but that also naturally exists in all these other keys, A minor, G major, F major, E minor, and so on. So learning a C major chord, that's not really something you learn. Anyone 
who can push three buttons simultaneously can play a C major chord. I've got one finger, my dog's got two paws, you know, we're covered. There you go. So the C major chord, it exists in all these keys and how you play it, how you approach it, how you leave from it will change dependent on what's happening harmonically and musically around you. So that's what she wants you to do. Not just play these chords as they are, but as they would function musically in any situation. It's also fascinating, too, that uh, this is a very tonal approach to music at a time when some composers in Europe, especially in the German-speaking parts of Europe, are writing atonal music and so forth. And, of course, she's very interested in Stravinsky and uh, these composers who are writing what we would think of as, quote-unquote, very modern music. And these are very sort of old-fashioned principles Mm -hmm. that she's trying to inculcate into her students. Uh, And it's really kind of a foundational sense of this is what music is about. And then from there, we have the freedom to explore further what it can do. So after hearing all this about how she's able to hear things so quickly, move from this chord to anything else or resolve in any way you want, with all of that, let's just take a moment to listen to the beginning of that song I mentioned before, Extaz. It's beautiful. She's basically going from chord to chord in a progression, and the voicing is wonderful. It feels like we're just being guided along. Now, how many songs start with an introduction? Most of them, right, Evan? It's, sure. That's that's just what how that's how it goes, and it's common to hear that introductory part repeat when the voice comes in. So when you hear the first chord that she plays, we hear a B as this highest note, and when the voice comes in. Then with that same chord, it settles in on a B, that voice. So then that B in the high voice of the piano is omitted. For example. So that's not very profound, but I can't imagine her not grabbing your arm if you showed up, Evan, and said, hey, here's this new piece I got. And you um, had the B in the piano and in the voice at the same time. She might grab your arm. What are you doing? It's kind of a sense of economy, I think. She wants things to be, she wants to avoid anything superfluous in music. It's that less is more principle that yeah. um, we strive for here sometimes, yeah. but um, <laughs> she does it very well. So that's just a fraction of what's going on with her and her teaching and the approach that she has. And she's doing this from the 1920s in her her 30s. And in 1924, she has her first tour in the United States, and it's organized by the New York Symphony Society, which later becomes the New York Phil with another group. And among some of her works, she also premiered, and I did not know this, Evan, she premiered Copeland's Symphony for Organ and Orchestra, and that paints perfectly what you were saying before, She's playing these huge works and premiering them at the organ. Right. So it's throughout this time and the remainder of her life that musicians would just flock to her for lessons, even for just a couple. She is someone you could take a few lessons with, I think, Evan, and then spend years unpacking everything. That's also a common thing in music. You take a couple of lessons, and it might be two years later when some of that stuff fully sinks in. And again, that sense of economy, she was able to pack a lot of meaning into very brief expressions, both as a composer, I think as a performer, and certainly as a teacher. Just a few lessons, you could get a lot out of what she had to share. And I think we'll see that in the video as well. Everyone is just sitting on bated breath, waiting for her her next um, instruction. And she has some of the biggest names in music. Aaron Copeland, Bernstein, Elliot Carter, Philip Glass... Quincy Jones, who we heard at the beginning, studied with her, and they were, I don't know if close is the right word, but there was definitely a very fond relationship there. There's so many interviews of Quincy Jones talking about his time with Boulanger. Also, John Elliott Gardner, famous conductor, Virgil Thompson, George Walker, Quincy Jones to Joe Raposo writing the Sesame Street theme, Bye Bye Birdie by Charles Strauss. They studied with her. That's just a fraction. And one of the things that's fascinating about this list of names is how different they are. So you think of a composer like George Walker, uh, 
great uh, 20th century composer. Uh, of course, Aaron Copland's music is very familiar to many of us, uh, writing in a very different style. So, you know, there isn't this sense of like the Boulanger composition students all have this Boulanger sound. Mm -hmm. They have their own sound, and she, as a teacher, is helping them to find that sound and share it. You're right. It's just there is no... Oh, that's the... Philip Glass and Elliot Carter both studied with her. I mean, two more different composers would be hard to find. But there they are, and they both, I'm sure, benefited from what they learned from her. And her fame only grows in, um, in France. In 1932, she was given the highest order of merit, uh, Chevalier to the Légion d'Honneur. And she's given a similar award or um, merit in Poland in 1934. And we can list a bunch of these right now, right, Evan? In 1962, she becomes an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. 1962, the Howland Memorial Prize. 1975, you'll probably pronounce that one better than me. Uh, Medal d'Or of the Académie de Beaux-Arts and the Institut de France, another very prestigious award. Uh, she's a grand officier of the Légion d'Honneur in 1977. 1977, Order of the British Empire, Order of St. Charles of Monaco, Order of the Crown of Belgium. These, these uh, all over the world, she's getting this recognition for her, uh, for her meritorious contributions to the arts. One question I have is, I imagine she got some, like a little pin or an award. Actually, she did for the um, uh, the French one. She wore that on her um, suit, I believe. But did anyone give her a sword, I imagine? I don't know if it's because I watched <laughs> a documentary on Japanese swords the other day, but someone she had to have a sword. She's a grand officer in something, right? A little hard to conduct, maybe, with a rapier, but uh, I don't know. But uh, whether or not she had all the regalia, she certainly had the uh, recognition and the esteem and, uh, I think, well-deserved. I would put the sword, I would mount it above where I teach. No misbehaving. <laughs> she didn't need the sword to get people to be intimidated, though. That's true. And one of the longest ongoing things for her began in her early days of teaching. In music school, we have something called studio class. This is when your entire studio, meaning your teacher and their specific students, get together. And this is kind of free form. A lot can happen. Maybe one person plays and receives instruction while everyone listens, then someone else plays, or maybe you'll work on some ensemble music, mock auditions, orchestral work. It's really up to the, uh, to the teacher. But they're often every week. And Nadia Boulanger, she held them at her apartment in Paris for decades. And it became this kind of event. And you hear people like Bernstein describing her house, her apartment, her flat is just filled with pictures. And there's a big piano and everyone is just crammed in there, as many as possible, just to just to experience it. It's really a who's who of the musical world gathering in her apartment and uh, just to just to be a fly on the wall and to sit in the room with all that amazing talent. And as as we were saying, John, the the different kinds of talent, the you know, the different voices, the different styles, the different approaches. And mm -hmm. you have composers, you have pianists, you have conductors, you have all these different disciplines that are having this experience of learning with her. And in the 1930s, she comes back to the United States for a pretty demanding tour. Now she's conducting, and she's the first woman to conduct the New York Philharmonic, the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and the National Symphony Orchestra. Unfortunately, in the 1930s, we don't have any video of her um, conducting, but we do have a recording or two. Uh, one of them is a piano concerto by Jean Francais that she conducted with a composer at the piano in 1937. Her conducting career was pretty atypical for what we have today. You don't really read about her studying conducting at the Paris Conservatory. Would they have even allowed her? I doubt it. Um, there are conductors today who have said that they, as women, were prohibited from classes or they could only audit the class. Yeah. And that's today. Yeah. And she also wasn't a director of an orchestra nor would she may even be um, allowed. And she wasn't traveling and conducting orchestras, maybe like someone like Gustav Mahler. But you can remember from our episodes on conducting, it's not really about waving your arms around on stage um, looking like a star. 
It's about your deep understanding of the music. And she is able to convey these musical ideas, like you said, this economy of means directly getting things across. And when you work with a conductor like that, oh, it's so, so nice. Yeah. Making the making the ensemble sound really amazing, it, it takes, like you said, it's not just waving your arms. There has to be a, what you convey in the rehearsals. Uh, and what you're what you're able to express verbally as well as gesturally uh, as a conductor, as a music director, that's really and her talent in that really shines. You, we do have some recordings and certainly her reputation. But unfortunately, war would break out again in 1939, and we will get into that right after this. So, for the second time in her life, a world war breaks out. It's 1939. She is trying to get some students out of France, and she herself arrives in New York in November of 1940. And while she is here in the U.S., she's teaching at several schools, one of them the nearby to us Peabody Conservatory, and her influence teaching in the United States during these years should not be underestimated or understated. We said she had these demanding schedules before. I think she still has them now. And that is how she was also a huge influence on so many musicians like us who had teachers who studied with her directly. Yes. After the war, she returns to Paris in January 1946, and she becomes a professor at the Paris Conservatory. And now she's director of that uh, Fontainebleau school that we mentioned um, earlier. American Conservatory, yes. And... Her skills remained sharp basically through her seven decades of teaching. From this point, as she gets older, her eyesight and her hearing starts to um, fade away, I hear, maybe in the 1960s. But she would pass away at the age of 92 on October 22nd, 1979. And that documentary that I've we've mentioned a couple of times was made, I think, when she was 90. And you see her sitting at the piano um, as energetic and demanding as any other teacher in their prime. Yeah, she started teaching, as we said, John, in her teens and taught all the way up into her 90s. And uh, even with eyesight and hearing diminishing toward the end of her life, she just kept going really pretty much up to the end. But she was also a complicated figure as well. Award-winning musicologist Kendra Preston Leonard has written about some of this, and we'll go through it now a bit, and I'll leave a link to her writings and her webpage on the show notes page. So let's start with a quote that she included of American harpist Lillian Phillips, who studied with Boulanger in 1963. This is what Lillian Phillips has to say about Boulanger's teaching. Boulanger's masterclasses, are they to exploit her one or two most talented students and make complete fools of the others? I saw too many people made fools of and ridiculed by her, adults and even college professors. Maybe this is European teaching, but I went to all of those classes of hers and they were a waste of time. Yes, I learned a tremendous amount, how not to teach. And we'll pause on this for a moment because this is also going to apply to other things we say. When you hear that, when you read that, Evan, it's what Lillian says. It sounds, oh my gosh, so severe, um, so out of the ordinary, so kind of almost shocking. But the sad truth is this isn't unique. In fact, not strange at all, actually. Yeah. One of the most common experiences. Yeah. I think every musician has stories like this. I have several. And especially in the 20th century, the mid-20th century and earlier, conservatories today are quite ruthless. I mean, they really are. Yes. And this domineering authoritarian teaching style, was it was common in the 20th century. Absolutely. And you were a student at uh, New England Conservatory. I went to the Boston University School of Music, two really fine schools, if I may say modestly. Mm-hmm. And uh, certainly some great teaching going on there, some amazing students. And, you know, the long stories either or both of us could tell, John, about abusive teachers screaming mm-hmm. at students, people sobbing in the practice rooms. And, you know, this is just a, a part of the experience. And I think people more and more really questioning whether or not that's how it should be. Maybe we're starting to see some change, but even today in 2024, uh, it's not out of the ordinary for these really uh, outrageous behaviors to just be accepted. I do see and read things that 
are changing, of course, probably rather, rather slow. Even in the late 2000s when I was in school, I mean, Kleenex could have just, you know, they could have made a million dollars a day just by, you know, selling tissues. Yeah, the sobbing students, yeah. So that's all to say, I'm not surprised that this monumental figure, Nadia Boulanger, would also have some of these attributes. And the big thing to also remember, which some are certainly saying, is that, well, Nadia and her sister, Lily, they were coming into this field as women in the 1910s and 1920s. Think about everything that includes. Women in France did not even get the right to vote until 1944. Yeah. So I can understand that you have to be three times better than your male counterpart. And you also have to, I mean, you have to put your foot down in ways that are uncomfortable, but just to um, just to be there, maybe. Yeah, so they're, they're breaking the rules in a lot of ways as women uh, asserting themselves in male-dominated fields. And does that necessitate certain compromises that are uncomfortable for us to think about? It's, it's a hard question to answer. It is a hard question to answer. And Kendra Preston Leonard also writes, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, musicologist Susan Weiss, who attended the conservatory in order to study with Boulanger, wrote of her experiences that the young women were not treated as serious candidates for professional careers in music, particularly by Mademoiselle Boulanger. Composer Patricia Moorhead has commented that after telling Boulanger she was to be married to a fellow student, quote, my private lessons after our announcement were mostly about my duties as a good wife. Unfortunate to read, and yeah. then something also rampant then, and something also still happening now. And kind of astonishing that this amazing woman who, you know, was such a trailblazer would tell another woman like, oh, make sure you, you know, put your husband's slippers out when he comes home from bowling or whatever. Uh, I'm not really sure how that pans out. But, uh, you know, you see the compromises that are being made in these complicated situations. It's easy for us to judge. Maybe we should. Maybe we shouldn't. Uh, I don't think we should ignore it. Uh, but again, hard questions get raised when we look at the details. And another troubling aspect was that with Jewish students, she had many, but there was also, I don't want to say like a quote unquote limit, but she sought to also not have too many at once in the studio, or perhaps they were socially segregated at the American Conservatory. There's definitely some uh, some troubling things there in terms of relationships with Jewish students. Uh, you look about what's going on in French society at this time and going back further. You know, we could do a whole season of classical breakdown on the Dreyfus Affair and uh, its influence on the arts and so forth. And, uh, you know, where is Boulanger and all that? Was she a rabid anti-Semite? I doubt it. But uh, you definitely see some things that are very questionable in her conduct. Yes. Hard questions to to answer, often better suited to musicologists who um, devote study like Kendra Preston Leonard. I'll put a link to her website on the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. But we wanted to include that because, as I read from her and from others, there were serious concerns. And of course, this isn't limited to, limited to naughty boulanger whatsoever. Certainly not. But this is who we're talking about right at, at this moment. And she was a force, one of, if not the most influential musician and teacher in music of the 20th century. She has affected how we studied music in school and also how we teach. And we're definitely richer for having her and all the extraordinary work she did. And you and I are among the countless music people of the world, John, who had a teacher who had studied with her. So her mm -hmm. musical grandchildren are innumerable. Yes. And I encourage everyone to go to the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org because we're going to have video of her teaching, links to some of the things that we've mentioned so far, and just more resources um, to her music as well. Now it's time to get to your reviews from Apple Podcasts. And we have a review here from SugarCatGuy89 Cat Emoji. And I love this because I didn't know you could have an emoji in your username. So I love that. But uh, why don't you read this one for us, Evan? I like the show, but needs obscure composers and also some music that tells stories. Anywho, good show. Well, thank you so much, Sugar Cat Guy 89 Cat Emoji, for the five stars. Yes, obscure composers. Obscure is often in the eye of the beholder. So if you have some that are in your mind, 
definitely let me know at classicalbreakdown at weta.org. But just to give an example of one who I know nothing about, I just heard this composer on the way in on WETA Classical when Linda was on, a trio by John Antis, an American composer from the 18th century. It was a recording with the Vivaldi Project. I'll include it here, and sorry for any intonation uh, whiplash um, here, but incredible trio. I, I don't know anything about this composer at all, but I, I really, really liked it. So there's one, at least right there. So much to discover. And music that tells stories. I like that as well. We've had several in the past that we've done with symphonic poems and works that, yeah, well, tell a story, but it's been a while. Sure. Andre Made by, uh, uh, you and I talked about uh, Augusta Omez, and uh, you did an episode way back about uh, pictures at an exhibition, but yeah, more, more of that. I- I'd love to have more of those conversations with you, John. Yes. So if you have one in mind, a particular story, Osha Herazad is one that we did as well, but maybe I'll look for something along those lines as well. Well, thank you so much for writing in, and thank you for listening. And thank you, Evan, for joining me for this bite-sized conversation of Nadia Boulanger. Thank you, John. It's great to talk to a fellow Boulanger musical grandchild. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown, your guide to classical music. For more information on this episode, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. You can send me comments and episode ideas to classicalbreakdown at weta.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, leave a review in your podcast app. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from WETA Classical. Classical.